Well, welcome to the Science and Faith podcast with Dr. James Tour, and I'm your host, James Tour. And you can visit uh, jmtour.com to see my professional credentials or drjamestour.org to see my social media sites. Uh, and as with all the, the interviews, this one was done with the help of uh, Ryan Harden and Justin Sessman. And, uh, uh, and this is all being done in conjunction also with City Rise Network. You can go to signup.drjamestour.org to be part of the questioning audience for future interviews. I'm a practicing scientist and I love Jesus more than anything else in the world. And uh, if, if you don't know Jesus and uh, you'd like to have a, a, uh, a private time with me where I can tell you how I became a person of faith, I am glad to do that. You could contact me at tour, T-O-U-R, at drjamestour.org and uh, we'll get together and I'll be able to share that with you. Uh, and with that backdrop, let me introduce my guest today. Uh, Bill Dembski is a mathematician, philosopher, and theologian. Bill completed an undergraduate degree in psychology in 1981 at the University of Illinois at Chicago, a master's degree in statistics in 83 at the University of Illinois at Chicago, a master's degree in mathematics in 1985 at the University of Chicago, a master's degree in philosophy in 1993 at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And then he completed two PhDs, one in mathematics in 1988 at the University of Chicago and a PhD in philosophy in 1996 at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And it, if this wasn't sufficient, he's got also a master's of, a master of divinity in theology in 1996 from Princeton Theological Seminary. Uh, Bill has worked at several places, uh, including, including uh, uh, the Discovery Institute Center for Science and Culture. Uh, he worked at the Philip E. Johnson Research, he was a Philip E. Johnson Research Professor of Science and Culture at Southern Evangelical Seminary in uh, Matthews, North Carolina. And he's written a bunch of books and a bunch of papers. I mean, a lot of papers. I was looking through this list of papers where he's, he's done a lot on information theory He's written several books on the topic, uh, No Free Lunch, Why Specified Complexity Cannot Be Purchased Without Intelligence, The Design Inference, Eliminating Chance Through Small Probabilities, and The Design Revolution, Answering the Toughest Questions About Intelligent Design, and also The Design of Life, Discovering Signs of Intelligence in Biological Systems. And uh, he also wrote a book called Being as Communion. And uh, uh, that's more more on the religious side. And so with that, Bill, I'm going to open it up for a question. First of all, my first question to you is, why do you believe in something so incredible as the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ? I think there, there are two things. I think one, the historical evidence is compelling for it, but more personally, uh, Jesus is real and made himself real to me. That was my burning question. It wasn't questions of science and faith that brought me uh, to uh, the, the faith in, in Jesus Christ. It was uh, at a difficult time in my life trying to understand how a perfect God could relate to very imperfect humanity. And I recognized myself as very imperfect. And it was at that moment that... Uh, God reached to me and made the incarnation real to me. I'd been a very nominal Catholic and understood that uh, to be a Catholic, you must believe that Jesus was God in the flesh. And I never accepted that as a Catholic. Uh, but uh, when God made that clear that it was in the incarnation, God becoming human, that, uh, that the connection was made, that there was a possibility of relationship that transformed my life. And then the resurrection, you know, became part of that, obviously. So that was, that was my turning point. Okay. Well, um, you know, I believe the same thing. And I'm I just, it's always exciting for me to hear people who, who are not, uh, not uh, um, pastors and, and, and religious teachers to see their perspective on that. Because uh, uh, sometimes there's this view that you can't you can't uh, be a believer in these sort of things 
and uh, be a good scientist or a good mathematician. And, and uh, I think historically, uh, many of the people who were the great scientists believed in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, and uh, I just like the world to see that, that these, these can still hold. Tell me, how long have you been working in this area of information theory? Uh, if you think of information theory as a branch of probability, it would go even back to my doctoral dissertation and at the University of Chicago in 88. But I think uh, specifically on how these ideas impact origin of life, subsequent development of life, I would say probably around 1990, 91, I wrote a paper called Randomness by Design, where a lot of these sorts of ideas that I played with in subsequent years were uh, in embryo form there. Okay. And I've, I've learned a couple of things as I've prepared for this by, by uh, watching some of your videos and reading some of your, 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 your thoughts. Uh, and it, it's, what is information? And what you've listed you had a slide that says information is the realization of one possibility to the exclusion of others within a reference class of possibilities. Information yeah. is measured via probabilities. The smaller the probability, the greater the information. Right. And on that floor. What, what, uh, what, what does that mean? I mean, uh, basically for information to happen, there has to be a reduction of possibilities. If I say it's raining outside or it's not raining outside, I haven't given you any information. There's, I've not reduced any possibilities. If I tell you it's raining outside and I've excluded it's not raining outside. Uh, so that at its most general is what uh, information is. I mean, you can think of it in other contexts. It comes up all over the place, poker hands. If I tell you a uh, royal flush, you know, I've limited that to four possible hands out of almost 2.6 million possible uh, hands in, in poker. So it's always, you've got to exclude things and you know narrow down on one thing, exclude other things. Now, I think for most people, they think of information in digital terms. So it's like, I mean, we deal with DNA and proteins. And so often what you have is a uh, finite number of distinguishable elements, repeatable elements that are then arranged linearly. Now, in practice, that's how we identify information. You know, so with the poker hands, I could, you know, uh, represent them in bit strings, you know, so then that's a way of conveniently organizing information for computational purposes. But at its most general, it is a reduction of possibilities. I, mean, I can just give you another example uh, for about the last 10 years, I've been involved in, in business. Uh, and one of the things I do to earn money is generate leads. Now, what's a lead? Uh, I may want to uh, give a school somebody who's likely to enroll in their program. Now, if I take somebody off the street, uh, you know, it's very unlikely that that person is going to want to enroll at some school. But if I can get them to a website where they are they got there by an organic search where they're asking, you know, doing their keyword search in terms of that uh, program, then they're psychologically primed. I've reduced the number of people and I've gotten a subpopulation that's much more likely to enroll than the general population. So it's that reduction. Well, why am I getting money? It's because of the information I am giving uh, the schools. I'm giving them, it's not that there's going to be a guaranteed enrollment, but it's a higher probability of enrollment. So information is always this narrowing down. And the more you narrow down, the more information you're given. And then, you know, you can put it in terms of just sheer possibilities, just counting them. But in practice, what we do is we look at probabilities. So the, uh, when, when I was generating leads for schools, they would like to see about a 2% enrollment rate on the, on the leads that I gave them. You know? So that's, that's how, how it works and it works across the board, but you can always represent information digitally. So in terms of these, you know, alphanumeric character strings, you know, linearly arranged, and then we can do, then we can do computation with them. So that's, that's a whole other aspect to it. So now when you, when you think about information, in DNA, this 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 can go to when you have DNA or you have now RNA. This can be translated to a protein. 
any three bases can be a codon, but right. just having a random set of codons is not the type of information, it was my impression, not the type of information that's going to get you what you need to have construction of, of an enzyme that's going to build something that's relevant to life. And, yeah. and um, uh, uh, I've heard this term Shannon information versus, versus uh, specified complexity. Shannon information is, is, is based off of this work from Shannon in the 1940s where he, he was able to extract information from randomness. And I think it was Leslie Orgel even used the term, the, 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 the famous origin of life researcher from the yes. 20th century used the term specified complexity, that you need something that's much more advanced than just Shannon-like information if you're going to have life. So I've just thrown out a bunch of terms here sure. that, that uh, you're an expert in and I'm not, and I want you to, to bring this home for me. Yeah. Well, I mean, Shannon was uh, back in the late 40s. He was trying to understand communication channels and how do you move information from one uh, place to another uh, across a, a channel. And the idea there was, I mean, he wasn't concerned with what the message is that you're moving. I mean, it was just any, any bit string, and he was looking mainly at bits, you know, was as good as any other. So there was, uh, and in fact, he made it very clear that he wasn't concerned about the semantics of the information. I mean, what was, what was of concern for him is if there was a sequence of bits at one end of the channel, it needed to get reliably to the other end of the channel. And so then uh, other things that would come up are noise on the channel and error correcting codes and all of that. So there's a whole technology that was built on top of it. But it's, it's very much in line with what we just said. I mean, basically you have this whole range of possible things that you could be sending and then which are the interesting ones. And you know, if we look at it in the biological context, well, what are the interesting strings of DNA? Well, it's those that code for functional proteins. The vast majority are going to be gibberish. They're not going to code for anything. And likewise, the vast majority of bit strings are not going to be an ASCII code spelling out some meaningful English text. They're going to be gibberish. They're going to not serve any purpose. And so the specification always refers to some sort of meaningful or independent pattern that we wouldn't expect on the basis of chance. So it's that that's where, where the idea of specification comes in. And then that needs to be uh, cashed out in various ways because uh, you know, in many human contexts, the patterns are imposed externally. So you know, I might put a target on a wall and start shooting an arrow at it. And if I keep hitting the target, you know, I'm gonna say, well, that's uh, I'm the, the, the person who's who's shooting that arrow must be a uh, an experienced archer, you know. So it's happening by design rather than chance. Uh, but then I think in the biological context, these specifications are internally given. It's the the functional requirements, the the, the functionality that you're getting out of these systems. Uh, that's that's what you know that things are alive rather than dead. And it's a lot there are a lot more ways to be dead than to be alive. And so that's why. Again, you have that reduction. You know, it's like, well, what are the what are the ways of being alive? And they're they're much fewer, and those end up being specified. Okay, so so you know, one one of the things that I I, I think that that I learned by by just studying some of your work was that people have done Darwinian searches. So because you want to take something that may have happened over millions of years and reduce that down to a time frame where we live so that I can publish a paper in the next year or two on this topic. I have to do this in silico. I have to do this in a computer. So you do Darwinian searches, but uh, they are infused with information because people have done what they've called Darwinian searches, and they show that things can improve, that you'll get improvement, which is different than new speciations, but still still they get these improvements. But these are, are filled with information, and I think you've referred to it as hyper heuristics, where you, you're putting information on top of information, and then you're never helping the prob the, the, the problem. You're just you're 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 either keeping it equivalent or making the problem harder as a result. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, this is a very common problem. And I was actually just reading a book by a friend of mine, Eric Larson, on the myth of artificial intelligence. And so he's looking at, for instance, machine learning. And that's how with machine learning, you always have to bias the search. Bias is not in the sense of being bigoted. It's that you're you're trying to solve a problem. And so you have to arrange the, the whole machine learning uh, context in a way that it gets to that solution. Okay, so there's the solution. Well, that's a specification, you know. And so, but by biasing it in one way, you you don't allow it to solve other problems. And that's that's the the issue when when you have, for instance, evolutionary computing, the sorts of things you, you're referring to, where you set up maybe a fitness landscape, which gets you to a certain place, but by getting you there, you don't go to other places. So. What does it, but then what does improvement there mean? What does it mean to have a specification? I mean, in, in these evolutionary computing contexts, you're trying to solve a problem. It's a well-defined problem. And then there is this target out that, that you're trying to reach. It might be that you're trying to do a crooked uh, wire genetic uh, antenna. You know, So you're trying to get a little antenna that uh, radiates uh, across a, a hemisphere. And uh, so you, you run an algorithm and you get there. But you've set up the optimization, you've set it all up so that it will evolve there. If it evolves there, it's not going to evolve elsewhere. So it's uh, uh, probably the best, you know, where, where this clicked with me years back. And in a sense, I reinvented the no free lunch theorems because I was reading Richard Dawkins. I mean, Dawkins has been incredibly uh, fecund for me, I mean, fruitful in, in reading him because I think his, his mistakes are so... Uh, uh, so insightful in some ways. But uh, he has an example in which he will evolve a target phrase. Um, he thinks it is like a weasel taken from Shakespeare. And he'll start with some random characters, but then as, as you're getting closer to that target sequence by some sort of metric, it's like a, a hamming metric, uh, he'll have, be able to evolve there in about 43 steps. Whereas if you were just randomly generating sequences, it would take about 10 to the 40 steps on average. I mean, you can do these waiting times, you know, so how long would it take to get there? And so he gets there very quickly, but it's because he's biased the algorithm and he could have, he could have set up the, the fitness landscape instead of going for that target phrase, any other phrase, and it could have been a random phrase, and then it would have gone there. So why is it that the search, yes, the search worked well, it was an evolutionary search, but how did you get the search that got you to that target? And that's really been the, the thrust of my work with Bob Marks, that it's, it's, it's not the search that, you know, we, we shouldn't be mystified that the search is getting us this information, it's how did we get the search that gets us the information? And you know, I think that's where Dawkins does this sleight of hand, and many people in this evolutionary computing business, as they try to use uh, evolutionary processes to try to justify biological evolution, they'll basically they slip in this information, and they don't they don't go back a step further and say, okay, where did the search come from that allowed the allowed us to get to this information? And so we can actually, we've mathematically, what we've done is we've uh, computed uh, what the information requirement is when you look at a, a space of searches. You know, so it's you basically what you do is instead of the original search, now you're searching a space of searches and the problem just gets more difficult. So this is, this is the, the, the whole issue of this uh, conservation of information that you, as you try to account for information, the information problem either stays the same, that would be conservation, or it gets worse. And you just, you know, and, and basically just, basically what it means is that as you try to uncover a source of information, there's more and more information that you need to, need to get. Actually, John von Neumann made a similar uh, argument in the 1940s, where it was basically the idea was if you have a self-replicating machine, there's gotta be more information in the machine than in the, the product. And so you don't, you can't really get a self-replicating machine uh, where it's basically all self-accounted for. So these ideas have some history, but it's, uh, I, I think what the results that I've come up with with Bob Marks and some of his students, uh, it seems to me really nail things down that you haven't solved the information problem. All you're doing is displacing it. You're sending it back further, which then raises the question, where's the ultimate source of information? 
That's exactly what evolution, uh, materialistic evolutionists don't want because what they want to do is com explain complexity from simplicity. They want some sort of primordial simplicity and then get it all by this magical process of evolution. And what we're saying is uh, that information is basically a form of accounting. And when you do the accounting, uh, the problem always gets worse as you go back. So you haven't really explained anything. You've just moved the problem around. It's like a little shell game. Uh, you know, and I, I think for, for me, it's very, very compelling. But, uh, you know, these ideas, it seems, have not gotten as much play as they should. Yeah, this is, this is, uh, this is interesting in the context in which, which I think a lot about, which is origin of life. And my argument has always been molecules don't care about life. Organisms care about life. Molecules don't care. They yeah. don't know how to move toward life. They have never been shown to move toward life. There's no interest in moving toward life. They have no brain, no desire to move toward life. And, and, uh, uh, and so when you set up a target and you say, here is a cell, I want you to move toward that cell, you've already heavily biased the system. And now what you're saying is the information that I input to say, I want you to make this cell, that's an enormous amount of information that I've put in there. And, and I've, I've heavily biased this system to try to go toward that. When it, in, in its own view, it would have no desire to go toward that than to go in the other direction. Yeah. Well, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, everything from the, the field of evolutionary computing, computational intelligence underwrites that. I mean, that you have to, that it is the computer programmer, the designer that's inputting all this information. Uh, so there was a colleague of Bob Marx uh, who would call himself a penalty function artist because in order to make these algorithms work, you know, penalties are kind of the flip side of fitness. So you try to increase fitness or you try to minimize the penalties, but it's the same, same concept. And uh, so he was finding that, uh, you know, there was, and this is, this is I think, universally that the, 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 the designer, the programmer has to put in all this information. From the biology, when, when you talk to the uh, evolutionary biologists, the materialistic ones, however, it's as though once you get uh, natural selection working, it's, it's just magic. So, you know, to your point, well, once you can get some little simple replicator, you know, just some string of some ribozyme, you know, then it's, it's all going to just bootstrap. It's all just going to run and uh, the information will magically materialize and finally uh, you're going to presto change or you're going to have a cell. And it's, it's just nonsense. But, uh, you know, it's, it's the evolutionists in this case that are the, the, the mystery mongers. You know, I think uh, the, the, all the real science here is on our side. Yeah, well, you, you know, I've, I've given them, I say, okay, you can't get the ribozyme because you can't make the sugar that, so that you can't make the ribose. If you had the ribose, you can't hook these together because you get two five linkages, you get three five linkages, and your yields are so low. But anyway, I'll give you the ribozyme. I'll not just give you the ribozyme. I'll give you all the amino acids that you want in homochiral form. I'll give you all the, the sugars that you want in homochiral form. I'll even hook them together for you and any sequence that you want. And I'll, so you can have whatever information you want, get the information from a living cell. And now all I'm asking you to do is take all those components, which I, which I just took out of a living cell, I deconstructed it and took all these pieces and I put them before you in your pristine laboratory, not in a cave, not under a rock. Now go ahead and assemble, an, uh, assemble a cell that's gonna have life. Nobody, nobody would ever say that they could assemble a cell from that. And so when they come with these little things that you have a ribozyme and then you get a cell, it's, it's kind of silly. I mean, people have made YouTube videos that, okay, now that you have a ribozyme and you have these components, now all you need is millions of years and you'll have a cell. Yep. Where do you get that? How, uh, if you can't do it in your lab, how do these things construct? There's a huge amount of information, even in, from the components to the full assembly, because they have no idea that they want to go toward the full assembly. There's no desire to do this. Molecules have no, no, no desire to move toward life. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And also, I mean, the, the information problem, I think often the, the neo-Darwinist wants to put it in terms of, well, it's just, it's all in the genetics, you know, that we've got the full body plan. 
And it's not just in the genetics. There's the epigenetics. There's all sorts of spatial relationships in these components which have to be there to have a functioning cell. So the, the information problem is immense. But uh, and I think they they think that somehow, I mean, I've heard it, you know, to, to your, your point just now, uh, people coming back and saying in hushed tones, well, natural selection is just smarter than us, you know. Uh, they can, it's natural selection can do it, but we can't, you know, and it's, uh, it, it's almost, you know, substitute natural selection for God, you know, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's just a, a it, you know, and then we are the crazy ones because we believe in God, the real God, you know, who, yeah. who actually has the capacity to do all of this. Yeah. And, and, you know, the creative power of natural selection, uh, the, the evidence for it is nil. Indeed, their, their selector, their selector is their intelligent designer. They are the ones who are grabbing the concept of intelligent design and putting it upon their selector. Because a selector has to be extremely complex, generally more complex than the thing that it's selecting. And uh, uh, so, so w what about this thought that some have put forth that, okay, well, you have a room, 12 people are in that room, and they all have different birthdays. The probability of having those 12 different birthdays from those 12 people in that room, I mean, is a very, very small probability that you'll ever ever see that, but you have it. And therefore, this is somehow solving the problem of the information problem that we need toward life. Yeah. Are you familiar with these arguments? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I mean it, it's, it's just that these highly, highly improbable things happen all the time. And so we shouldn't be surprised if we've got something. But let me turn that birthday uh, analogy around. What happens if all those people, those 12 people in the room, all had the same birthday? It all happens to be March 29th, 2012. That happened by chance? I mean, it's the same improbability. It's one in... 365 to the 12th power, right? Um, so did that happen by chance? I would say if you say, if you're gonna argue by parity of reasoning, one is as improbable as the other. So sure, you know, those 12 people, they all had the same birthday, nothing, nothing, you know, nothing to see here, you know, no, no, nothing to explain. I, I'd say you're terribly naive, you know? So what, what is the difference there? Well, in one case, there's there's a specification. There's a there's a. I mean, you can put it in terms of Kolmogorov of complexity that it's much uh, there's a much more compressed way of saying this. You know, everyone has birthday March 29th versus person one had birthday this, person two this, person three this, person four that. That takes a much longer specification. You know, so it's uh, so these compact specifications, those are the ones that require explanation. But yeah, I mean, this this argument, I've seen it over and over. And it's as though, you know, I wrote my book, The Design Inference, which was published with Cambridge University Press, you know, so not, uh, you know, not a vanity press. And, uh, you know, I, I made that point, you know, that it's, it's not just brute improbability. It's the improbability when it matches up with a pattern a specification. That's when. Uh, things require explanation, and it's as though you know I might just not as well have written the book. You know, you know, it's like oh, we'll just ignore the guy. What 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 can he know? And then they just go off. I mean, there's just this vast ignorance and arrogance. It seems you know that they they can just ignore this and get away with it. Yeah, well, I, I mean, you got full agreement with me. I mean, people will say, well, tour, why don't you just publish in Origin of Life and let these ideas be known? Listen, people have already shared these views. Uh, Clement Riker just shared these views in, 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 in uh, uh, Nature Communications two years ago where he said every time you have too much input, you have operator input, you're using pure chemicals, and all of these problems he maps out. They totally disregard his paper, and they say, well, Tour, you shouldn't make your YouTube videos because uh, just write a paper. People ignore it. People ignore it. So you can point these things out, and my argument is, when you have stepped into your laboratory, you have influenced that experiment. Every time you choose a chemical off the shelf, you influence that experiment. Even the groups that say that they're trying to take the human influence out, you look at their setups and they've got all of these tubings coming in, hooked up to a computer at precise times and every, everything is extremely well mapped out. And there's all this, this, this human input here, which is sort of like your, your concept of, of uh, hyper heuristics, where you're putting in all of this input, which makes the probability of this 
get go go you, you know it's it's working against you so you don't you don't think that actually that accurately captures prebiotic conditions with what's going on. No, it's hard for me to imagine that on an early Earth. Yeah. It's really yeah. all the tight yeah, reactions. Intelligence is, you know, that's okay. Pat Spermia is okay. Directed Pat Spermia, where space aliens come and they they do their experiments and they create life on Earth. Or, you know, and and then when you finally get them in a corner, they say, "Well, it." We've seen these things in outer space. They say, okay, it's the same periodic table. We're talking about origin of first life. Whether you're in outer space, anywhere in this universe, our periodic table is the same. You don't want to explain it on this planet? Explain it in space. Explain it on, Earth, on some other planet. Anything you want, to, you want to pull together, it actually gets harder when you try to pull these molecules together when you're out in space and not confined to the individual flask of the planet Earth. Yeah. Really, Earth really is a pretty hard. hospitable place, you know, by comparison with the rest of the universe, as far as we know. So, yes, know. yes. I mean, yeah. What happens in space to molecules is they're constantly being bashed apart at, 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 at the rate that things are traveling. So, anyway, we're going to turn to some questions now from 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 our our YouTube audience. And so, uh, um, so let, let's see if you can ha handle these, Bill. I, I um, you look like you're in shape. So, so. We'll see if you can handle these. <laughs> I hope the physical and the mental that they, they work together here. Okay. Yeah. In the protein synthesis, a sequence of nucleotides is read and transcribed, and the sequence is then translated into an amino acid sequence. What chemical explanation exists for the writing of the sequence into the DNA or RNA molecule in the first place? Given the age of our universe, is chance and time sufficient? Well, you know, I think if, if you're just trying to create uh, DNA sequences or protein sequences in some sort of prebiotic conditions, I, I, I think you, you spoke to it essentially. I mean, you know, you even if you have a chemical supply company, you know, then then it may may help you. But I mean, under realistic prebiotic conditions, these things don't form. I mean, just even getting linear chains where you've got the right uh, chiralities and everything, I mean, it's, it's just very difficult. I mean, and you know, then you can also get side chains, you get the wrong linkages, you have interfering cross reactions. So all of that becomes very difficult. So let's even just look within cellular context. Uh, you know, how do you get a code? I mean, it is a code where you translate from uh, the DNA into protein, you know? And what's remarkable to me is that uh, Shannon, it was in 1948-49, somewhere in there, that he comes up with this information theory and where you've got the codes. A code is not just uh, sequential information. It's going, it's a translation, as it were, from one type of information to another, digital information. Uh, and so he was concerned with that along uh, electronic communication channels. Well, he comes up with that, and in the next decade, we find exactly that in the cell. And you wonder, you know, would, it, would we have even figured out what was going on in the cell if we hadn't had that prior mathematical knowledge of how coding works? So, so you have this, and it's, it just requires an immense amount of machinery for all of this to, to come into play. And there's, there's a minimal complexity argument here in the sense that, okay, if this evolved, from what simpler system did it evolve? We have no example of that. You know, you've got the DNA, the protein. Uh, it's got to be constructed with, with some uh, uh, ribosomes. I mean, the enzymes, all of this, it's, it's just one package deal. Uh, and there, there's, no, uh, there, there's no account of how you could have had a simpler system that, that led to this. So, uh, you know, in terms of, I mean... You know, I have what I call universal probability bounds. I mean, one is, uh, and, it, and there's, there's, there's converging lines of evidence for this. It's around 10 and 1 to the 20, uh, 10 to the 120, 10 to the 150. So take the reciprocal of that for the probabilities, 10 to the 120. That's by looking at the total amount of computation that's possible in the universe. Uh, Seth, uh, Seth Lloyd at uh, MIT has, a, I think, a very reliable estimate there. And so 
you know, in terms of the number of events where you can try to accomplish something by chance, it's very limited in the known physical universe. Well, I mean, you're looking at, when you're looking in the cell with uh, these systems, I mean, just even simplest ribosome, I think has what, I mean, about 80 protein parts. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible. So, I mean, you know, I'm not even sure you need to say, okay, you know, how many 10 to the 10 to the 10 years is it going to require for something like this to happen by chance? I mean, it is, it is so far out there that, you know, I, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure you even need to go there. You know, I mean, it's, uh, it's, if, if, you, if you're invoking those sorts of probabilities, you don't have an explanation. You know, I mean, it's... Uh, yeah, and, and, you know, something that, that's come up recently that people are always saying, well, you know, you, you keep invoking a cell. The cell back then, the original cells were much less complex than the bacteria today, much less complex. So this has now been calculated. Biophysicists calculated it. And I've shown this on my recent video series that you need at least 205 protein coding genes and you need a litany of certain functions that are going to be operable. And that's provided that you had all 20 amino acids that could come to you exogenously because you don't have the machinery to make them. So it's not that far less complex than what we have today. The, the least complex system that we have today, the simplest cells that, that we have today, have about 500 protein coding genes. So it's not that far less complex the computationally least complex system that you could possibly model. So, yeah. so this whole argument that things were just much simpler and then evolution took over. No, it wasn't much simpler. So these things are just getting uh, uh, tossed away. Yeah. No, if you're looking at cells of the sort that we currently have, and the only, not just that, that we currently have, but the only type we know, you know, uh, I mean, these uh, minimal complexity argument of the sort that you're making, I mean, that's, that holds, I mean, it's still, you know, yes, the, you know, they'll say the cell was so much simpler back then, but even at its simplest, it's still immensely complex. So you, what you have to do is then argue for some sort of radically simpler, but also different type of life form that could have evolved into the current life form. Okay, what was that? You know, and, and there's just total silence. They have no... There, there, there's, there's no understanding except, uh, well, we may have had a re replicator. Once we got the replicator, you know, all that natural selection, you know, it's, it's just a done deal that we're going to get something like, like us. And, you know, it's, it, it's just pure mystery mongering. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go to another question. Can you explain the law of small probability and its relation to the total number of actions available and its relevance to the implausibility of abiogenesis slash evolution? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, law of small probability, I think I put it in those terms in uh, the design inference. I'm not sure I put it in quite those terms anymore. But I mean, the, the basic idea is that if there are things which are within the reach of chance and outside the reach of chance, and it depends on how many opportunities there are for something to happen. So if I flip a coin and I get 10 heads in a row, you know, given if... Uh, you know, it's one in about a thousand improbability for that to happen. That could happen by chance. Now, it could also happen that, you know, I approach you and I say, hey, I just flipped a thousand head, uh, flipped 10 heads in a row. But it turns out I'd been spending about an hour before that flipping a coin. I waited until I got those 10 heads in a row. You know, in a sense, then I, I hid all those failed coin flips. But what if I instead said, well, you know, I just was flipping a coin. I got 100 heads in a row. Well, if every human being in the history of the earth did nothing but flip coins, you still wouldn't expect to see 100 heads in a row. So, you know, so that's, that's the idea. How many opportunities do you have? And the reason I was going to these Law, law of small probability it was questioning then, well, what is, what is a small probability on the scale of the known physical universe? You've got about 10 to the 80 uh, elementary particles. You have so much time. There's a certain rate at which uh, matter can change states. And when you factor all that in, I came up with what I regard as a conservative estimate of 10 to the 150. That, so that becomes a universal probability bound at the scale of the known physical universe. Uh, so 
you know, and, and the thing is, I mean, you get those numbers very easily, you know, with, with any, an average protein is going to be over a hundred amino acids. And even when you allow for substitutions, you know, it's, you're going to get still, it's going to be very improbable. So these numbers apply very readily uh, to the biological context, but you know, where, where this is going though, in cosmology is that, well, you know, 10 to the 150 just isn't enough. So let's get multiple universes. And so then we get, uh, then we vastly inflate the, the probabilistic resources. And then suddenly we, we don't, you know, we, we can get a lot of things by chance that we couldn't before. But the problem is when you allow yourself that move, then you also have to explain a lot of things away that you wouldn't otherwise. So, you know, it seems like I'm a, somewhat intelligent person who's communicating language and meaningful communication relative to information and biology, but maybe there's really nothing going on in my head. It's just that there are these random sounds that are coming out of my uh, mouth and it just happens to be that they correspond to something that seems meaningful. So really I'm just this kind of random automaton uh, and there's some possible world where this is the case, where there's no mental life but I just happen to be speaking this way. And that, and you're gonna to have to accept that if you're gonna go with this multi-universe where anything that's possible is actually realized in some, some place. Okay, if proteins are created by protein synthesis, but proteins are necessary to, to kick okay. the process of protein synthesis in the first place, is there an explanation for what created those very first proteins? Yeah. Well, you're going to, it, it seems, I mean, there's this chicken and egg problem. You need the yeah. DNA to get the protein, but then you need the proteins, especially the enzymes and things to, to work with the DNA. And so, so there's, uh, so that's, so you have this whole integrated system. I mean, that, that, that's a problem with uh, uh, design generally. I mean, when you, when people build machines, I mean, they're integrated holes. I mean, so where everything has to work together and uh, you know, if you allow yourself, uh, vast improbabilities, you know, and then you can say, well, there must something, you know, this cell materialized by chance with this whole machinery, and there it is. And so we're just going to accept it. But uh, most people, you know, are going to say that's not an adequate explanation. So then you've got to either go with some sort of design hypothesis, it seems to me, or you have to tell an evolutionary story, which is then from simplicity to complexity, and you have this gradual buildup where structures and functions co-evolve, and then one, and then there's never a big jump in improbability at any one point. And I, I should point out, I mean, the evolutionists, when they're not bashing intelligent design people, they are sensitive to these improbability jumps. I mean, for instance, if they could get some mechanism for getting homochirality, getting all the, the L amino acids. You know, they would they would tout that and say, "See, there was never really a problem there because now we can get that with high probability." So that's what they're always shooting for. They do want they do want a gradual path where no step along the way is too improbable, but they're never able to identify it. You know, so it's it's it becomes an article of faith, especially at the prebiotic level. Right, and 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 what we know now is that that amino acids don't just hook together. So if you say the amino acids just randomly hook together <clears throat> and that's how you got your first protein, amino acids don't hook together. So it may be that, that Miller-Urey was a red herring, that, that you'd have to have other ways to get these together. And there's recent publications of some suggestions on that, but again, with, with no, no uh, chance for homochirality for anything. But just amino acids, there's vitorionic and they don't just hook together. And we've been beating our heads together and trying to say, well, how do these things hook together? If you could get the amino acids and let's say asparagine can crystallize and you can get a crystal of just the L and others could crystallize on it. And let's, so, so I'll give you, I'll give you all the homochiral amino acids. Now, what are you going to do? <clears throat> you can't get them to polymerize. They don't polymerize. And then the other thing is you have to be able to block the active side chain, or those compete in the polymerization. So we don't know how to polymerize those. So even if you had those, it doesn't solve the problem. That's why I'll give them everything. I'll give them the DNA, the RNA, the proteins, the, the, the lipids, and say, now just assemble a cell. You're trying to solve all this, I'll give it to you. Can you now assemble a cell? 
And they're like, no, I can't do that. This is a, it's a very hard problem. So to, to suggest that uh, all you need is, is these components and a million years, no, it doesn't happen. What happens in those million years? <clears throat> you got to be able to describe that. All right, here's another question for you. Is it possible to arrange a single equation that can illustrate the collective improbabilities of an accidental development of a single cell? You know, it seems to me that the, the problem is so immense. We don't even know what all the sources of information are inside the cell. You know, I mean, there's, there, uh, you know, it's, it's often said that DNA contains the body plan for the cell. It doesn't. I mean, there, you can make changes in cell walls, which then get transmitted, uh, you know, hereditarily down the line. So uh, the sources of information are huge. So my approach has always been, you know, if a subsystem is designed, then the whole system is designed. And so try to look at manageable subsystems where you can actually do this probability calculations. The strongest research in that regard that I know is by Doug Axe, where he will look at the evolution of certain uh, proteins and just what are the improbabilities involved and the, the obstacles to that. So that's, uh, you know, so, you know, I mean, I've seen numbers, Fred Hoyle, I think one in 10 to the 40,000, you know, the, these numbers, I'm just not sure what sense to make of them. But, uh, but if I can assign some, some heavy duty improbabilities to a certain processes that I can understand, such as uh, with Doug Axe, I think it was a beta lactamase enzyme that was uh, conducive towards uh, antibiotic resistance and how do you evolve that from a uh, protein that does not have that functionality uh, and use getting, I think, improbabilities on the order of 10 to the minus 70. Uh, that to me is very compelling. And so you just keep keep whittling away and showing that you have these, these huge improbabilities, these hurdles that you have to overcome on well-defined systems. And it seems to me that's, that's where you want to work. But how do you get a grand number for... Uh, for a cell as a whole, I'm not sure how to do that because it seems that the probabilities are just so, uh, or the, the, the improbabilities are so immense, if you will. Right, and it's as you said at the beginning, we don't even understand all the complexities. One of the things that I've been showing people recently is Leventhal 2.0 paradox. Just the protein-protein interactions in a simple yeast cell with its 3,000 or so proteins uh, has just the non-covalent interaction arrangement is 10 to the 79 billion. How do you like that for a number? All right. So, so, so the, and, and, and the non-covalent arrangements are turning out to be highly important because you get electrostatic potentials, which pass information down these channels of, of non-covalent arrangements. And uh, uh, when you get, when you get numbers like that, you understand this better than I do. That number is is just just crazy, crazy big, and you don't know what to do with it. And that's just the protein protein interactions in a yeast cell. That's not the protein DNA actions and interactions and in, in all of that. So, and yeah. and that's why you can't dehydrate a cell totally, where you take out the structural waters and then rehydrate it and ever get it to work, because you've lost those non-covalent interactions that are not recoverable. That's the problem. Interesting. <clears throat> All right. So in recent years, it's been discovered that the genetic code is actually multiplexed and being quaternary gives greater potential than binary. Can you explain the significance of this? Uh, I think probably you'd be in a better position, but it seems that, uh, you know, when, with, with DNA, I mean, you can read it. I mean, there are different reading frames. You can uh, yeah, there's still sequences go yeah. backwards, forward. Uh, you know, this, this was, uh, I mean, in a sense, what we have it's in the DNA, it seems, is digital data embedding technologies and steganography, where you, you've got just multiple layers of information that, that are there. So, uh, uh, you know, and, and to me, that, that speaks of design. I mean, there's an efficiency. Uh, you know, it's almost like a crossword puzzle, as it were, embedded in there. And, you know, I mean, there's, there's no reason, it seems to me, for natural selection to create that sort of sophistication 
uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, I mean, and the, the, the word had always been, you know, there's junk DNA, it's just a lot of DNA is just carried along because it's just easier to keep replicating it rather than just uh, excising it by some sort of stringent editing features. Uh, and instead you find these digital data embedding technologies. So it's, uh, to me, that's, that's further evidence of design and against the materialistic account of evolution. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. I am somewhat familiar with Dr. Dembski's work, heard him speak once outside of Philadelphia, but only minimally. Dr. Dembski, what is the most frequent argument against your views and how do you answer that? Uh, I mean, there's, you know, I think a lot of people at some level uh, will resist intelligent design because of an argument from evil. I mean, it was the idea that there's bad design, that uh, evil design, parasitism, things like that. And so they don't even want to go there because, I mean, the, the, the rationale is, well, you know, you're a Christian, right? The designer is this Christian God. The Christian God is supposed to be good. And yet here we see all these malevolent designs. Therefore, you've got to be wrong. You know, so I think that's, that's a way of just short-circuiting things. Uh, you know, in terms of the information arguments, uh, I don't think they've got a response to, I mean, the, the conservation of information, I mean, these are mathematical theorems. You know, so they, they, they hold up, uh, they, they certainly apply to in the computational context, uh, but I think uh, people will say, well, it's just that uh, in biology, something else must be going on. But you know what it is, you know, they, they don't they don't articulate it. So uh, I think those those are probably the two main lines of uh, of concern that somehow these information arguments really aren't relevant in biology. But if if they're not relevant, then in what sense do uh, do the evolutionists have a scientific theory? Because it, it does seem, in fact, that this is this is the only way to make sense in a scientific way of evolutionary processes in terms of uh, information exchange, transmission, storage. So um, anyway, those, those are probably the two main lines. Okay, we're gonna wrap up <clears throat> with this one question. Your website says that you, quote, repudiate none of your work on intelligent design and may at some point return to working in the area, unquote. Can you elaborate why your website specifically states that you do not repudiate your work? Also, are your beliefs more in line with theistic evolution, intelligent design, or maybe both? Yeah, I mean, to the last point, uh, I'm not a big believer in common descent or universal common ancestry, just because I don't think the evidence supports it. So it's, uh, you know, when I look especially uh, taxonomic levels, phyla, orders, classes, it just doesn't seem to me that the, the fossil evidence, the DNA evidence supports that. So that, you know, uh, in terms of why that line is there that I repeat none of, none of my work on intelligent design, there's a context and that's in 2016, uh, I felt that I had done some of my best work in this area and I, I think I, I felt I was getting stale and so I uh, announced my retirement from intelligent design. Well, uh, I'm, uh, I'm back at least in part, you know, so it's uh, it became a semi-retirement. And, you know, I think people, when I uh, announced my retirement, they thought, well, you know, he's, uh, he, he must have lost confidence in the work that he did. And that, that's not the case, you know. And so they, people were trying to put uh, words in my mouth on this. And I think the work was good. It was solid. Uh, but, you know, I'd been at it for 25 years and I needed a break and, uh, you know, so that's, and so I, I've got, I still have my fingers in it, but I have a day job. I mean, I'm an entrepreneur, I have websites, build educational technologies. And so I just don't get to spend a lot of time on this anymore. Mm -hmm. All right, Bill, thank you so much. Thank you for what you've, uh, you've brought to us and explained to us. I appreciate it. And uh, um, uh, this, this has been a good exchange. I, I really wanted to bring an expert in information uh, on, onto the program and, and help us out here and, and to un be able to understand all of this. And uh, um, uh, I think it's probably been, I don't know, 15 years since we had dinner together at my home. And uh, like a lovely family. It was so, so nice to visit with you then. I think it was in 2007. So it's, okay. uh, yeah, so it's so good to see you and wish you all the best.